Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, second session of DBGP workshop. In this session, we have two paper presentations and uh, three working progress presentation. Our first paper is from uh, University of uh, Edinburgh and University of Munster. Our speaker is Michael Stewart. This is that. All right, welcome everyone. Let me share my screen for a second. All right, now let me see that I actually play the presentation. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the for the introduction. Happy to be here. GPGPU is always a very fun event to attend uh, from my side. And uh, today we are going to talk about the work we have done on adding support for tensor cores to our high-level code generator. And I want to particularly focus on kind of the systematic approach we took to adding the support to, um, uh, to our high-level code generator. So what's the context here of the of the of the work? So uh, as you might kind of all know, uh, and we have seen kind of particular with GPGPU, right? We are kind of in the golden and new golden age of uh, computer architecture, as Hennessy and Patterson called it in their in their Turing Award uh, lecture, like once when they won the Turing Award a couple of years ago. And kind of one of the key messages they conveyed was this quote that I put up here is that they, that they predicted and said the next decade will see a Cambrian explosion, that means a lot of uh, novel computer architectures. And they say it's an exciting time for computer, uh, for, um, for computer architecture in academia and also in research. Okay, and I mean, that's a nice proposition or a nice point to see is saying like, oh, we have new architectures coming along, we will have much more specialized and novel architecture designs. But that obviously raises immediately the question, how are we going to actually program these new specialized hardware architectures? And to address this so in, that, in, that, in that area, we have seen for quite some time, a huge number of what I call high-level DSLs, high-level domain-specific languages, and often paired with a specific code generator that essentially together gives this uh, appealing promise that we write programs somehow in a simple, whatever that really means, but a simple high-level language. And then we achieve the high performance, at least from the application developer, kind of for free. Okay, and there are a huge number of these type of um, GPU specific or broader sense, but I mean, in the GPU area, a couple of these projects that I've mentioned here on the right, so stuff like Halide that is around now for over a decade almost, uh, Futhark, which is a high level GPU programming language like Accelerate and uh, TVM, a machine learning compiler, right? We have academic work like this Tiramisu compiler. Uh, and the project called Lift, which I was in language. NVIDIA was involved in these, um, the architects and engineers who built these systems that they have to face is like, how do we actually manage to keep pace with an increasingly faster changing hardware architectures, given that we are kind of in this new age, right? So how do we adopt and take one of these uh, existing sophisticated compilers, right? And add support for new architectures and new features when they come along. And that's the challenge we're going to look at today in the context of this paper. And the concrete case study in some sense we're going to look at are Tensor cores, which is a specialized hardware feature that NVIDIA has edited a couple of hardware generations ago. And that is a specialized hardware unit that is added to each of these uh, SM, these uh, SIMD multiprocessors that are on our GPUs. And this is a hardware unit that can perform a four by four matrix matrix multiply add instruction in hardware. In a kind of interesting mixed precision setup, so we have like two FP16 matrices A and B, they got multiplied and then they get added to an FP16 or FP32 um, matrix C, and that gives us a result D. And that is hardware accelerated. And when this was introduced in the, um, in the V100 GPU, 
the NVIDIA in their white paper um, claimed, or well, I mean, they, there's kind of, I mean, you can compute it obviously from the theoretical uh, throughput that you can do 12 times faster matrix multiplications than on the prior generation that didn't have this tensor core support. And that just by having designed a specialized hardware architecture that they can do this one computation incredibly efficiently. On the top right, you see kind of how we would think about using these tensor cores when we do kind of a, a matrix multiply on the entire device, on the entire GPU, and that is we break it down into smaller parts until we reach the warp level, meaning we have multiple threads cooperating together very closely, and they can then make advantage of this tensor hardware unit using a special warp level API that is exposed in CUDA, and so we have to kind of block this use this hardware and then assemble the individual pieces back together. And the API we see um, for this that, uh, that CUDA proposes uh, operates on what uh, NVIDIA calls fragments. So these are kind of parts of an overall matrix. And they provide an API such as you see here on the right-hand side, where um, we have functions such as these MMA, matrix multiply add, uh, which is uh, synchronous. Right, so that's the underscore sync, uh, or uh, instructions for uh, loading and storing these um, fragments into kind of the global memory of our matrix, filling a fragment, and so on. So this is the API that you would use in a CUDA program to uh, to code this, right? But how would we make this API accessible from a code generator such as uh, Helite, for example? So in Helite, they have talked about adding. For these tensor cores, for quite opened in December 2019, so over two, two and almost two and a half years ago, when they asked, like, are there any plans to add support for this new feature? That seems to be really exciting. And uh, Vinod Grover, one of the our colleagues from NVIDIA, said, like, oh, there's to get some okay performance. The sketch discussed here seems like a start, but it will still be a lot of work to, to get this in. Okay. And then there is actually a pull request that says, oh, we added initial support for these uh, tensor cores that was created in May 2021. So not half a year later, but a year and a half later. And that pull request is still open, right? So what does it make so complicated to add this to Helite? And even that pull request here, it kind of says it's a very limited form. We pattern match a specific metrics multiply uh, computation uh, and generate code from it. But somehow there's the open question, that's the last comment on this pull request, like, is this still active? Yes, it's still active, but it still hasn't done, right? So what makes it so challenging of adding, uh, or it seems that it's quite challenging on adding support for these specialized hardware and these existing uh, and this thing, uh, compilers. And in this paper, we want to present essentially kind of an alternative um, alternative proposal or alternative design uh, that is built on top of our um, of our compiler framework called uh, called Rise and Rise is uh, kind of the spiritual successor to a compiler project that we have designed before called Lift that some of you might know and the idea of this compiler is that we express computations expressed here in, uh, in orange uh, as compositions of kind of computational patterns, such as these map reduce join patterns, and that we have optimizations uh, that uh, we can that transform these computational patterns to achieve something like tiling uh, or other types of optimizations. And we can control and describe these optimizations using a dedicated language called Elevate. And then once we have kind of a recipe how to optimize and the computation to optimize, we kind of combine them together, perform rewriting, meaning we change the representation of our program, and with a low-level rewritten program, and then we generate CUDA code, OpenCL code from this to reflect these type of optimizations. So how does this look a little bit more concrete? Okay, so here we have how we would uh, kind of step-by-step -step compile uh, metrics multiplication in RISE. So we start at the top left with um, a high-level description of the program, okay? And here we use high-level functional primitives. So these are primitives such as map, reduce, zip, 
that are common in functional programming, but have now found their way in a lot of um, kind of computational, uh, computational framework, uh, such as TensorFlow and other stuff. Okay, and we describe computations by composing these functional primitives together. Crucially, these high level functional primitives, they do not yet specify how the computation is actually going to be executed. They just describe, oh, I'm going to reduce this array by summing all the elements up, but how that reduction is implemented is up to, uh, is not yet uh, determined, okay? And then the rewriting step, that determines then a concrete, a concrete way to implement this by turning this high level program into a low level program where we have low level functional primitives. So this now means that we use specific versions of these high level primitives to indicate, for example, that we want to do a map computation. So a data parallel computation over an array that we might want to do this with an entire block or a single thread of our GPU threading hierarchy, or that we want to do a reduction sequentially. And then after this representation or compiler, we perform a translation that goes uh, into an imperative representation at the top right. So there we have imperative primitives such as a sequential for loop or parallel for loops that again uh, indicate that we want to do a computation across an entire block or across multiple threads. And we have imperative concepts such as uh, memory allocation, memory assignment, and so on, that don't exist on the functional side that we had on the left-hand side, but the functional side is a very good way to perform this rewriting on, okay? And then in our last step, we generate then low-level imperative CUDA code in this case from this. So this is kind of the, the general process that we perform in RISE. So how do we add support for tensor cores to this, okay? And we follow now kind of a bottom-up approach. So meaning we kind of do the reverse of this process that I've just described, okay? And when we extending it by supporting uh, these tensor cores, okay? That means our approach will be out of three steps. We first going to add new low-level imperative primitives that correspond directly to the API uh, that uh, NVIDIA offers for supporting CUDA codes. And then we implement the code generation step that turns these imperative primitives into the CUDA API, okay? And then after we've done that, we're going to add low level functional primitives and explain how they get translated into their imperative counterparts. And finally, we are going to add rewrite rules and they will then enable that the high level program can be exploiting these tensor cores by mapping a high level computational, like a, uh, with these map reduce patterns and uh, mapping this directly or rewriting this into the low level functional primitives that expose these CUDA cores. Okay, so let's walk quickly over these three steps. So the first step is the, uh, designing these low level primitives. And I have shown on the left-hand side, again, the CUDA API, and we see that we design these, uh, these primitives on the right-hand side, these imperative primitives that are part of our RISE API. And there's a direct representation of the C API or C++ API on the left-hand side and the RISE imperative API on the right-hand side, even though you might not know a lot of the terminology we use on the right-hand side, but you can maybe see that there's a direct correspondence between these two, these two sides. And the only real addition we had to do besides adding these primitives was we had to add it support for these fragment type, which is kind of a new concept that didn't exist in our RISE setup before. And once we have this primitives ready, it's very straightforward to generate kind of the, the CUDA API. Like when you have like an MMA fragment primitive, you just generate the MMA underscore sync function when you see one of them. Okay, so this step becomes incredibly straightforward. And then as the next step, once we have these imperative APIs, these imperative primitives now, just show again on the right-hand side, we want to design functional primitives, which are shown that on the left-hand side, that we can rewrite our, uh, our uh, computations into. And that means we have here a one-to-one -one mapping again, where one low-level functional primitives, such as a tensor mutmult add, 
right, or an S fragment, S matrix, they correspond directly to the to the computation or to the effect being performed on the right hand side. Okay, and you can see that we are now thinking about these kind of functionally in the sense that we now have functions that return us a value. So, for example, the tensor matmult add returns us the computed fragment back. Okay, rather than returning nothing like being a void function or being kind of using one of these com uh, notations, that is how we express void uh, in our rice imperative layer. And the loading and storing from a fragment that now corresponds directly in this functional world of turning a matrix into a fragment or turning a fragment into a matrix. So it becomes kind of a transformation, um, which then when we implement it, turns into storing or loading a fragment to memory. And <clears throat> for doing the translation between these two layers now, <clears throat> we extend the existing translation infrastructure that we have in RISE. And there are two functions that kind of perform these translation. The one is called an acceptor translation, the other continuation translation. And they are kind of more detailed in the paper that I've shown before. But the key message here is that we have an existing translation where we essentially just add an additional case for each of the functional primitives. And you see this on the right-hand side that for example, <clears throat> we translate the S fragment uh, functional primitive into the load fragment function in the imperative primitives, right? And the tensor map mold will directly be translated into this MMA fragment step. And the final bit we now have to add in our code generator to make this all work is that we adding a rewrite rule or rewrite rule Right, And these enable us to automatically exploit tensor cores when we have computations that can take advantage of them. So on the right hand side, we see an example that shows how we can map a matrix, uh, matrix multiplication that we see in the functional high level style at the top. Right, So we uh, map over um, a, a matrix A, we map over a matrix B, and then we uh, zip combine these two elements together and then perform a reduction by multiplying the, the A and B elements and adding them all up. And if we see this uh, pattern in our high level program, then we can already turn this, as this rewrite rule says, it directly into a tensor matmult call with the appropriate arguments being inserted. And uh, that means everywhere where we see this type of matrix multiplication, we can apply this rewrite rule and we can then automatically get the advantage of using the tensor cores. And in the context of RISE, we've explored different ways how we can apply these rewrite rules, either automatically, there are papers actually from a prior GPGPU paper, uh, GPGPU workshop, where we talked about this. We have a paper explaining how we can uh, combine and describe these optimizations manually, or we have new work undergo where we combine these automatic and manual techniques to guide this rewriting that will help us to essentially combine the best out of these worlds. So having control, but also getting the benefits of a fully automated system. So after we have now added all of these steps, so we added imperative primitives, functional primitives, a translation, a, a translation between them and these rewrite rules, um, we are actually able to generate um, NVIDIA, uh, sorry, CUDA code uh, that exploits tensor cores from a high level uh, functional representation of a matrix multiplication. And we see here in this graph our performance evaluation on two different GPUs at the top an NVIDIA RTX and at the bottom a GeForce RTX uh, 2080 Ti. And this measures tensor, uh, teraflops, so higher is better. And the purple bar is the version of the code that we automatically generate from our high level expression. And we can see that we achieve competitive performance to the kind of dark green and then slightly other dark green color, which are the two versions that also exploit tensor cores either with a man manually handwritten optimized CUDA kernel or the rightmost bar shows the CUDA Kublas version of GEM that uses tensor cores. And one thing besides the fact that we are matching reasonably close to performance that I want to highlight is that if you look at the uh, second bar from the right, you see how much the performance difference is by exploiting the specialized hardware. The second bar from the right shows the Kublas version that does not use tensor cores. And we easily outperform by multiple times uh, 
the um, kind of a graphics card or an, a software version that doesn't use the specialized hardware. So the benefits of adding the support to our code generator are huge and having kind of a systematic way to think about this or to add this um, is kind of a, a, I think like a nice contribution that hopefully kind of these extensible compiler designs can also be picked up in other systems. So that's all I wanted to talk to, uh, to about. I think the take home message is that we hopefully have demonstrated that, that our RISE compiler is an extensible design allowing to target specialized hardware. And I think these progressive compilations are going from something high level functional to something low level functional, then to something low level imperative, and then to the actual code you want to generate that this progressive compilation turns out to be a good idea that actually allows us to extend this in a fairly straightforward way. So, and uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to answer a couple of questions. Thank you, Michael. Uh, are there any questions from audience? So uh, is your design focused on just a uh, gem operation or it can support other low primitive operations like convolution on tensor cores? Right, so, um, the specialized hardware that we are using, right? So that obviously has kind of support for these four by four matrix multiplications, but you're right that you can use this for more computations than just uh, accelerating gem, right? We haven't explored this much so far, but how we would add this in our design would be now to essentially just add new rewrite rules that explain how you would turn, for example, a stencil high level uh, computation into um, kind of by into a functional expression that uses this low level functional expressions that exploit this tensor core API. So that is something that we haven't explored, but there's kind of a straightforward pathway or the, it's clear where we would extend our compiler to add support like that. Thank you. So, then uh, so there's a yes. question in the chat I see, which I can answer. I see there's some performance gaps between your implementation and video implementation. Do we know where the gaps are coming from? Um, so you're absolutely right that we are kind of 10 to 36% off from the Kublas implementation, right? Uh, I don't think that that is a necessarily a huge surprise because we haven't extensively explored the design space of possible kind of choices you might make on tile sizes, for example, or a slightly other uh, kind of interplay with other features of the hardware architecture. Um, so I, I think that like in library that has been kind of engineered for the, getting the best performance out of this, I think there's kind of always a bit more, um, like they have always a bit of an advantage. The big advantage that we obviously have is what we just discussed, that we can fairly easily support other types of computations. And that's what we're hoping to explore next. Uh, any more questions? All right, thank you so much, Michael, again. And um, we can move on to the next talk. Thank you very much. Uh, sure.